and we are back. So we're talking about tandem mass spectrometry now. The easiest analogy that I can give to this is like cracking an egg. So we're going to get more information when we do that and we can take advantage of it in several different ways. I'll actually have to talk to you a little bit about the MS instrumentation, but keep in mind this is a topic that we will cover up a lot more detail a little bit later on in the course. So just a taste of the mass analyzers. But to get things started, let's look at this very simple chemical reaction. So you've got a compound. It's ionized. It's got a charge. Plus one. All we're going to do is crack it. Let's not worry about how that happens, but somehow it does. The molecule breaks into two pieces. One of those pieces carries the charge. The other one doesn't. How do I know that? Well, you've got to add up the charges. They have, to, they have to balance out somehow. So I've created a fragment ion which mass spectrometry can work with, and I've created a neutral, which is kind of like mass spec doesn't know what to do with that. There's a trick, I'll save that for the end. So practical example here, let's say you have our favorite molecule now, cocaine, and it's detected with a, a mass of, in this case, it's gonna be 304. Why do I know that? Well, because this has to be protonated. I'm looking at electrospray ionization, and this is what we would see. Now, if we were going to go through the process of actually breaking that molecule down, we would need a different kind of mass spectrometer. We're going to call this tandem mass spectrometry, and it's basically two mass spectrometers in one. So what's going to happen here is it's going to crack the molecule somewhere. Usually it does so along the easiest bond. So when that happens, you can kind of think, well, which side does have the charge? So which side are we going to detect? And if you add up all the numbers, you should find it at this region over here. That's not to say that you wouldn't detect the other side because imagine we have like a billion of these ions kind of floating around in the mass spectrometer. The probability could allow us to fragment at different regions of the molecule and maybe even for that proton to migrate from one side to the other. But this is the simple analogy of creating a fragmentation spectrum. Now there are actually two completely independent ways of producing fragmentation spectra in mass spectrometry. The first one here has to do with electron ionization. We talked about that before just briefly, the idea of knocking an electron off to ionize our compound. The second one is what we're talking about now. So it's tandem mass spectrometry, which is going to make use of a process after the ionization step. So we're gonna use a process like electrospray ionization, which tends not to fragment the molecule in that initial step. But once it's gone into the gas phase, into the mass spectrometer, we can do something else to break it down. Usually that process is something that we call collision-induced dissociation. So just to show you the difference that these different ionization methods will produce, just looking at the spectrum of cocaine here, there's all kinds of fragment ions that are produced. So yeah, a little bit of the intact molecule is visible down there at 303, but everything else is just pieces of that molecule. It's basically being blown up to bits. When we look at electrospray ionization, we tend to just see the intact molecule, so 304 in this case. We tend to call these things hard ionization versus soft ionization. So hard just basically means lots of energy, so much so that it tends to crack the molecule into pieces. And soft is we just have enough to produce the intact molecule. So let's focus on how a mass spectrometer can perform a tandem MS experiment. And I chose to talk about this instrument called time of flight because I do find it to be probably the easiest one to understand. With time of flight, it's just a race to the finish line. So you see these two different compounds here. The big circle is a big molecule and the small one is a small one. They're starting, well that was kind of obvious, yeah. So they're all starting at the source region. Now I'm gonna turn on the voltage and it just kicks them, they fly to the other side and they bend back on themselves. And you watch the race and you can see, ta-da, the small one has won. So we're using the speed that they travel through this flight tube, their flight time, and flight, to distinguish their masses. Okay, how do we make advantage of that? Well, let's throw in another piece to the puzzle. Let's throw in, like, we call this a voltage gate. It's sort of a region where I can turn on or off the voltage, but it's directed downwards. And what that will do is it'll push the ion down and away from the detector. So if I were to do that just at the right time, I can find now a spot where I kill or remove that one ion and allow the other one to pass through. So this is basically the process that allows us to select an ion of a given mass to charge. Once we've selected that ion, we have to break it down. So this process called collision-induced dissociation is really nothing simpler than just 
taking that molecule and banging it into some gas. Usually we have like a box within the mass analyzer that has helium gas floating in there. So there's gonna be collisions, there are high energy collisions, it's enough that it breaks the molecule down. And once that happens, well, all the pieces have new masses, so they're gonna sort of fly through at their own rates. Well, not exactly in this here, but I'll get to that later. So what you're looking at here is called a TOF TOF. It's two time of flight instruments sort of merged together. There's a collision cell between the two of them. The first one allows us to select the ions, as I've showed you by that gated system. And the second one is there to be able to scan the fragment ions. So, so once they've broken through that collision cell, the fragments can be moving with their own speeds, and then we can detect them as a, a fragmentation spectrum. So just notice the pattern here. You've got MS1, you've got MS2 in the middle, and then a collision cell in between. That pattern actually repeats itself with these instruments that we kind of refer to as tandem in space. So in addition to a toff toff instrument, you also have what we call a triple quadrupole. The triple is a little bit of a misnomer because the, the second one is really just a collision cell, but we still call it a, a triple quad. And then on the other side of the screen here, you see that box called the ion trap. Now ion traps basically collect all of the ions in one single region, but we can take advantage of that to selectively isolate just one of those molecules and then fragment it within that box. So since the process of isolating the parent molecule and then creating the fragments, scanning the fragments, all occurs in the same place, we call it tandem in time because those things are happening one after the other. So let's get to the triple quad and more specifically, we should focus on one of the quadrupoles. So you can see a diagram of it at the bottom of your screen, but let's take a look at it in real life. Now, of course, they do come in different sizes. So this is an example right here. But the characteristic feature is that you have these four rods, four quadrupoles, that have voltages applied to them. The goal is for ions to pass through those rods. The voltage is kind of complicated. It's moving up and down, so there's an oscillating field, which actually causes the ions to oscillate up and down as well. In this case here, you're seeing a stable ion. The mass to charge is just right, so it gets all the way through. Now you're seeing a different mass to charge, and it doesn't have the right mass to get stable, so it just gets knocked off to the sides. So you can really think of this instrument like a filter, a mass filter. That's a picture of the triple quad instrument where the, the middle box is the collision cell and they're just lined up one after the other. With the triple quad, you can do all kinds of different experiments. So you can do what we call a product ion scan. You can do neutral ion scans. And then there's even more coming, which we're gonna talk about in the next video, the MRM scans. But for now, I do want to go through the different types of scans that you can do with a triple quad instrument. Here they are over here, the product, precursor, and neutral loss scans. So let's just go through them one by one. There are just subtle differences between them, but they are quite distinct. So a product ion scan, the point of it is to be able to take any given molecule out of a mixture and then fragment that molecule. So you can imagine that little cluster, you get the red little particle and then all those, these are supposed to be molecules. But if I were to just throw them into like one single collision cell, all of the molecules would break down. You'd get all of the fragments that just creates this jumbled up mess. So you wouldn't understand what you're looking at. To create a proper fragmentation spectrum, you need to pick just the one molecule that you want. So that's what our goal in the first scan would be. So from the first MS spectrum, I've got one single molecule up there, M over Z400, that's the one I'm interested in. So what I'll do is tune the quadrupole to just let that one mass go right through. And all the masses in between that, higher or lower, they just sort of bang into the sides. So the spectrum that you would observe now is just a nice clean spectrum that just have the single M over Z. Now we'll continue that pattern through to the triple quad. So that one ion has made it through, all the other ions just sort of disappeared. Here's where they get into the collision cell. So in the collision cell, it bangs with the helium, makes the smaller fragments, and now we're gonna use the second, technically the third quadrupole, but you know what I mean, this, the second part of the tandem MS to scan all of those fragments. So they go through and we're allowing the ions through one at a time to be able to sort out a full mass spectrum. So the spectrum that you see over here would represent the single molecule, M over Z400, broken down into pieces. M over Z400 happens to be gone because it's all fragmented. You may or may not get a little bit of that trace ion left over. So that's kind of the normal scenario, but I'll give you a different situation here. 
the molecule that you're looking at over there is a phospholipid. They're the, the molecules that make up like cell membranes. The thing with phospholipids is that they're all different masses because the chain lengths come in different sizes, different lengths. So if I'm interested in studying phospholipids from a complex mixture that has all kinds of other stuff in there, the problem that I'd have with that experiment is that I wouldn't know which mass to start with. All the masses are different. However, I do know that there is a common piece of, the, of that molecule. That common piece produces a fragment ion, and that fragment is always m over z 153. So isn't that convenient? No matter what the initial mass is, the fragment mass is always 153. So we can use that as kind of a signature to say, show me all the different molecules that happen to produce a fragment at 153. So the idea here is that you're just kind of reversing the process. You're taking the second mass analyzer, Q3. I know it's second, third, but that's the one that you're fixing, in this case to M over Z 153. And then on the other side, you're going to scan every single ion, allow them through. Once they break in the collision cell, if they produce a fragment at 153, it'll go through and detect it. So that's how you will be able to discern which molecule has that fragment from which one does not. So that's what we call a precursor ion scan. Now the last one is called a neutral law scan. Now I said at the beginning of this video that the neutral component of our fragment, the one that doesn't carry the charge, can't be detected. And that's because mass spectrometry is designed to kind of control the path to move ions. No charge, no control. They just sort of fly off on their own accord. However, you can take a trick here to kind of see what the neutral mass would correspond to. So when would that be an important situation? So kind of the same idea, you've got this molecule that creates a common fragment. However, that fragment never carries the charge. It's the other side of the molecule that carries the charge, but that side is always different. So it's the neutral piece that's in common. How do you detect it if it doesn't have a charge? Well, what you're gonna do is you're gonna figure out what mass you're interested in. So let's say in this example here, the mass is 98. So my parent mass going in, subtract the neutral mass is a number that we would know. If the mass would be 400 minus 98, well, there would be 302. So I can always set Q1 at one mass and set Q3 offset by that neutral mass. And then I scan the two together. So no matter where I am at one number, the other quadrupole is always offset by that same mass. So we're not technically detecting the neutral mass, we're detecting the molecule that produced that neutral mass. So it is a useful trick. So yeah, three different modes of scanning in a triple quad. They are important. There are subtle differences between them, but I'm hoping that if you go through this a little bit, it'll all make sense. We'll catch you around in the next video. See you later.